Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning panels are always harder ones because everyone's waking up or still coming in. <laughs> yeah. All right, my name is Paula Carvajal Kerr, or as my uh, student name online goes, it's Paula CK. I am here to welcome you guys to the Fandom Latina panel, the Latina representation in geekdom. Uh, I'm going to let my beautiful panelists introduce themselves to so let us know uh, who you are, what you do, and what uh, geekdom or works you're affiliated with. Hmm. However you guys want to start. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> The person at the end always has to go last. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Kristen Perez. I am one of a group of three beautiful women who co-host a uh, podcast called Comadre C Comics. We highlight the female and Latinx presence in the comic book industry as creators, characters, and fans. And I also am co-owner of Heidi Ho Comics in Santa Monica. We are the oldest still running comic book shop in Los Angeles County. My name is Jen, well, short for Jennifer, and I work with Kristen at Heidi Ho Comics, and I'm also part of the podcast, um, and it's mostly what I do. She explained most of it. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Sarah, and I also am part of this wonderful trio, uh, Comadres y Comics, and um, I was introduced to comic books uh, by reading them with my dad, and then I worked for Diamond Comics, the industry reader of comic books, so that's how I am involved. I know, boo! <laughs> <laughs> My name is Crystal Flores. Hold on, I'm um, I do cosplay, and I am, I love lucha, I love wrestling. My parents got me into it since I was little, and it's stuck since then, so, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yuri Casco, and I have a YouTube channel, uh, YNC Comics, and we go to all the events. Uh, and especially highlighting everything that is uh, the, ri the writers, the artists, and whenever we have a Latino, we make sure that we highlight them the most. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Delina Gonzalez, and I am an artist. I work primarily um, on Jalisco, and I use the penciler for it, but I'm also an animator and a voice actor. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, my name is Caden Phoenix. I'm a writer creator of Jalisco, um, and I am working on Santa right now, so we have a series, it's the Ala Brava universe, so expect more Latina superheroes. Yay, so thank you ladies. So my goal behind this panel was to introduce um, uh, Latinx, primarily female, that um, were involved in geekdom, as I feel sometimes we are underrepresented, not just in characters, but as well as in the industry and the pieces that we do, such as creators and artists, as well as commentators, podcasters, gamers, as I'm a gamer myself. Um, and so I wanted to be able to have that opportunity to just share our experiences and then talk it out. Hopefully this becomes a bigger thing in the future. Um, so I do have a few questions. So my first one is, when did you guys start noticing the lack of Latinx and female representation in your geek interests? <laughs> okay. This is Jen, and it was immediately. Um, so the first time I stepped into a comic book store was when I was 13, and the Teen Titans show had just ended, and I w was desperate for content. And there used to be a comic book store uh, in Norwalk, uh, and I was just there one day uh, with my parents, and they were off doing something, and they let me run free. And I saw the comic book store, and I stepped in, and immediately the atmosphere was hostile uh, because there was no young women there was no there wasn't even a single person of color in the comic book store and it was just like I had this overwhelming aura of why are you here you don't belong here so that kind of stuck with me and I never stepped into a comic book store until I was 19 and I was going to El Camino College and I went to Jeffrey's comics and I was just like maybe I'll give comic books a try again and it, I haven't looked back since. I can also answer to that. Uh, I had a similar experience, but mm -hmm. lucky for me, I was with a gentleman, but I was, we walked in together to the comic book store, and the same thing happened. He went into his little corner, and I started looking for something that would call my attention, and that's when I noticed that there was not that many female color comic books out there, mm -hmm. but I also, the environment changed. I noticed how everybody was looking at me as, what are you doing here? Like, you don't belong here. And uh, I always wanted to go to a Comic Con. And I never had the courage to go because I never noticed people like, that look like me around the area. 
So I will always avoid them. And it wasn't until I told a guy, hey, I always wanted to go to one of those, but I never had the courage. And he was like, I'll take you. And that's really how our video started. Mm -hmm. Because um, he said, I'll take you. I've been to those, and those are fun. I love comic books. And, and when we went to the Comic-Con, it was so amazing because he saw how excited I was. I was, mind you, I was probably like 25. or, <laughs> And I was acting like an eight-year-old in a toy store. And he started recording just because he saw how excited I was to look for through comic books. And, and that's how the, the or video uh, um, or YouTube channel started. He was like, you know what? There's probably a lot of other people that are afraid to go to a, com a comic con and they don't know what it's like. What about if we record your experience and invite people to come? And maybe because they see you, you're a girl, they'll like to come to the conventions. And that's where we are here today. Um, hi everyone. And so uh, I come from a writing and directing background, more so film and TV, so I can't speak mainly um, in regards to comics as much, even though I do have a graphic novel. Uh, so I have a, one older brother who's one year older than me, and so we were raised pretty much the same. Like I had Barbies, but I had Ninja Turtles at the same time, to be honest with you, right? Because he was my buddy. We always played it together. And so um, same thing with movies. I went to the movies. We saw lots of action movies with my grandparents. It did not matter what was at, we saw it. And so in that regard, I was sheltered, obviously. To maybe to a good extent or not, but I did not see a difference. Um, not until I was much older, of course, but I did not necessarily see race. And so, like, when I eventually learned of the sense of otherness, then I was like, oh, yeah, you know, at least we have a Jeff Moreno, you know, at that time, at least. But um, I never really saw that divide, which was a very nice thing now because, like, anything, anything and everything I write is Latina, because why wouldn't it be, right? Because we are people. So when I saw people on screen, those are people. Uh, in, in that regard, so same, it was a nice sheltered and, like, ignorant point of view at that time, but it worked me because, same thing, I write people. We just happen to be Latina or Latino. Um, so. Kind of on that same vein, um, on the opposite side of that, I never saw representation, you know, and I come from animation background. I watched a lot of cartoons. Um, I've always wanted to be an animator. So um, it just didn't, it wasn't something that I really like thought about, but it didn't feel good because I wanted to cosplay and I wanted to do a lot of things and not seeing anybody who looked like me. I didn't look like any of the characters. I bought foundation that was way too light for me. I like was so upset that I looked horrible in blonde wigs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until I started getting older that I was like, wait a minute, that's not, that's not a me problem. That's a this problem. There needs to be more people that look like me in general. Anyone else on that question? Same. Paula, you might be able to relate on this since you play video games. <laughs> so, um, I started playing video games since I was little. My mom would take me to the donut shops like all the time. <laughs> I didn't realize, I wouldn't notice until like I started getting older, you know, I started growing things that I was like, oh hey, I'm a chick and there's not many girls playing video games. It was a big thing, I would play DDR, I'd go to like all kinds of arcades all over, like South Bay, out to Orange County, and then I would hang out with this group of people that I still hang out with to this day. Majority all guys. And so they would teach me how to play, I would show up with them, none of the other guys knew me, so they'd be like, oh how cute, some girl here, just a little gamer chick, <laughs> here with her little boyfriend coming right. here, and like, I was like, I'm about to whoop your ass, dude, just watch right now. <laughs> and so that's when I kind of started noticing, like, wow, there's not that many, because they'd be like, oh, you're a girl, you should, I've never seen a girl play before like that, that's actually good. I'm like, well, there's a first time for everything. So that's, I think, when I really started noticing. It. Cool, thank you, guys. So then my next question, kind of in tandem with that, is going to be, what, um, have you, what has been your experiences as females in your geekdom or fandom, either positive or negative? I, I can I can speak a little bit about that. Um, because we do a YouTube channel, we started doing videos in Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. uh, because to me, Spanish, I just flew, I'm more fluent in Spanish, it's my first language. And I will say that it, it's been really positive. We came across a lot of people that message us that are from uh, Latin America and Mexico, and they were looking for someone who did these videos in Spanish. So I, mostly the events, I don't do it bilingual anymore because it's a lot of work. But the, uh, when I talk about comic books themselves or the collection I have, I do it in Spanish and English. And it's because we notice that there's a lot of people that collect comic books that just don't speak the language, but they do share the passion. And uh, even though the characters may not be the same as them, at the end of the day, they're people. And we relate to these characters because they go through the same life stories or the same struggles that we do. 
So that's for me. It's been a very positive, and we uh, we made friends all over, and even in Spain, we're we're coming across people that are collecting comic books in Spain. So it's pretty amazing. Um, well, for me, my experience is uh, much like Jen and and Kristen. Um, I was never really geeky enough. Like I always had to uh, prove my geekiness to our male con counterparts, and uh, so my experience wasn't so good until I started going to conventions where I felt more welcome. There was just a bigger, broader spectrum of people, so I had the good and the bad. So, um, but right now it's all great. I mean, I see all of you guys here, and it's I feel like the love. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, we're very, very new. We just came out with the coloring book uh, two weeks ago. The graphic novel comes in this week. It's been in back order. So absolutely new. But um, thus far, super amazing, super great. Uh, everyone, even my mom, right, we're all very critical. The, uh, that's Latinas, right? Oh, yeah. And so <laughs> when I say, like, she has a Fakorica dress, she has it out, and the blades come out they all give me a nod. And like, that is amazing. Like that is one of the best compliments I've gotten even here with just random strangers. Uh, because they, they can't say, well, why isn't it this? Or why isn't it? my mom mainly. But like, sh she even gave me the nod when I was like, coloring book. And she's like, she walked away. And I was like, great. <laughs> and I was so happy she didn't tell me, well, how come, you know, just the, the helpful stuff that they tell us. Uh, so super great. I've gotten, um, especially on Instagram and well, Facebook and Instagram as well, like so many people tell me thank you, especially like Flocotical troops, like teachers tell me. And so it's a really amazing thing um, to feel that. So as a retailer, I also have a little bit of a perspective from the other side of the counter. Um, mm -hmm. Being a woman who was not really into comics before I bought the comic book shop, um, <laughs> I actually had a, a partner, have a partner, who was, and so that uh, forced me into comic shops for you know Valentine's Day, Christmas, gifts, whatever. <laughs> and the patronizing and just ignoring yeah. that I got when I walked into the shops made it so that when I actually purchased Heidi Ho, that one of the main goals for me was to never make anybody, um, but women especially, feel the way that I was made to be felt when I walked into a comic book shop in the past. So, um, but on that uh, side, I still get, uh, not so much now, but in the very beginning, I would get guys coming into the shop and asking me a question, and I would answer their question, and then they would walk over to a male uh, employee <laughs> and ask them the very same question, and the joke was on them because most of the male employees were more gaming gamers, and they would tell her, oh, you have to ask her. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> But another thing as well, I mean, we do comics, but we also have a huge Magic the Gathering um, community in our store. And when we have events, it's usually like 50 guys and Jen and I. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started a Lady Plains Walker group, which is a Wednesday group that specifically is a more casual entry into playing the game. And it is um, less uh, competitive. Um, and it's a place for people to come and feel comfortable to either learn how to play or to um, actually just play in a more uh, low-key setting but it's uh, I think it's a way for women to come and to um, feel a little bit less intimidating because walking into a, a room full of literally 50 to 60 men and you being the only woman that is intimidating I don't care who you are so it's those kinds of things that I've done to try to um, make my shop feel more inviting to not just women, but marginalized groups in general. I make it a point to have uh, conventions and signings for women and people of color. We had a, a, a pride con in June. So I think it's really um, my, it's, it's my job to make my store as accessible to everybody as possible. And then what have you guys' experience been being primarily uh, Latinx and having that experience in the community that is often not showcasing a lot of people of color? So working as a retailer in, um, uh, in Heidi Ho Comics, uh, we get a lot of tourists uh, and uh, like people from Mexico or like uh, South America, Central America, and they come in and they always look very lost. And sometimes uh, the 
based on how I look and everything, you would think they would come up to me and try to speak in Spanish or like ask. And they usually don't. So I have to go and then uh, talk to them in Spanish and give kind of that comfort. So uh, just be like, hey, I can speak Spanish. And that the relief on their faces usually when I'm speaking in Spanish and they're like, oh, thank God I'm not going to be lost anymore. Uh, is it, it's, it's very helpful. So uh, in that manner, my Latinx identity has helped me in the retailer uh, business side. In the geek side of it, when I first started attending cons, I didn't see a lot of people like me. Um, uh, so it was, it was very isolating at first. Um, uh, but as uh, time has progressed and with everything, uh, we, ha we are seeing more people that look like us at conventions, and it's a lot more comforting. I think the, the language is probably what, for, in my case, because it's a, a channel, um, the language connects me, because a lot of times you, are, you could be next to a Latina, and you have no idea she's a Latina, because what is really a Latina today is Everybody looks so much alike. We're so mixed, and um, I didn't see that in the in the YouTube channels that I follow. I noticed that there wasn't much Spanish videos, and that's the reason why we started making Spanish videos. Um, we just did a, or our hundred episode, and we actually decided to do it on uh, comic books and the process of sending your comic book to the CGC, or how do you get it in slab and. And we wanted to do something meaningful that wasn't out there, and we took the time to do it in Spanish. And so to me, it was the language. And a lot of the people that comment sometimes don't look Hispanic. They look Anglo, or they look uh, European. And that's when we realized that we're all connected, because a lot of Europeans move in into our countries in Central America. And so I, I think for me it's been the language that's connected me to other people and to appreciate also the differences and, um, and how similar we are. And that video specifically, we've gotten a lot of uh, comments and, and messages from people across thanking us for that video being in Spanish. I think for Commodity Comics, um, a lot of the feedback we've gotten is just the fact that because we are Latina, we have had and grown up in, in Latino families, we've had those experiences. And so even just we review books uh, and even our rating system is on a stale scale of one to three conchas. And when other <laughs> Latinos see that, and they're like, oh my God, that's so awesome. That, and, and I mean, and then there's a funny story about why it's three conchas. It's because <laughs> Jen's mom, that's the most concha that her mom would ever let her eat. So that was like the best. So that's why uh, three conchas. But if it's a book we really like, it's three conchas. Or no, it's the whole panadaria. Or three conchas and a cup of champurrado. So people listening to us identify with that. And I think it makes this um, the the comic community and and industry more accessible to them and uh, you know we get feedback on our our iTunes saying you know it's just like listening to my tias uh, cheese me out on a weekend or whatever <laughs> and and that was really our our goal and so getting that kind of feedback is awesome. Well, not only that, I mean, the meeting all these Latinx uh, car uh, creators, writers, artists, it's been very welcoming. It's like coming home. So um, just opening ourselves up to the community has been amazing. It's been a very welcome experience for us. I think that's the most amazing thing so far um, as a female Latinx creator is for a long time, I think that a lot of us weren't connected. We didn't really know how to find each other. And I think it was kind of like, it used to be like, you don't really talk about like your own experiences. A lot of the characters I drew, a lot of the stories I wrote, weren't really from my own experiences. And then once I started connecting with other Latinx creators, suddenly it was like, everything was more accessible in terms of being able to just like create about that and feel comfortable and be able to explore that all together. Absolutely. I um, totally agree. It's been an amazing experience. I mean, I have six Latina artists, which is a really nice thing um, because I, I hold the power, right? And so um, I hired three Latina, um, three Chicanas, three Mexicanas because why not? Like, where are we, right? It's literally that. But it's also like when you say, I have a superhero, 
right? Like, everyone's like, oh, I dance flocorico. And I was like, that is amazing. Like, that's, you know, I'm always just amazed with everything anyone says. But, like, my cinematographer, she danced flocorico when she was, like, four years old. My mom, it's based on my mom. My mom danced flocorico in my whole childhood. And so that is why I have the superhero of my mom, essentially. And so um, it's the community. It is the culture, right? We're all connected to our culture no matter where in Latin or Latina world we are. Um, but, you know, there's nostalgia. It's something that we all understand. We understand the oppression. We understand socioeconomics. We understand how we are seen in this world in the United States, you know, and then in the other countries as well. Um, so we all come together no matter what at the end of the day. That's actually a good segue to my next question yeah. where I was going to ask, um, how have your other experiences involving other inter intersectionalities? So you're female, you're Latinx, but then there's also other pieces of our identities that we incorporate, right? So how has that experience been having all of them uh, kind of meet at this one place this, at this time? Okay. It, it makes us stronger, honestly. Like I'm so much stronger because of that, right? That is your superpower. Your differences are your powers, right? Mm -hmm. You walk into a room with 50 guys, you are the strongest one there. See, that's literally the truth of it, right? Because it's a sense of otherness. Then they'll get to be aware oh, other people exist besides myself. It's literally get over yourself, you know, in that regard. Um, and I told you I was raised very equal, but, but like, you know, like a guy or whatnot, but very equal in my mind and everything else. Not until I went to the real world that I saw the difference and I had to learn the sense of otherness because um, my family never treated me differently, right? Because why would they? So intersectionality is kind of, uh, it's it's in the description of what our our podcast is. We highlight uh, female and Latinx presence in comic book industry, and I think through that we've really not. It's not a struggle, but I mean, real talk. There are issues um, when it comes to intersectionality and people of color, and when you're in big groups where there's a big mixture, there can be issues. I mean, I was part of a big group um, where it was um, female comic book retailers. And there was a lot of issues with the women of color feeling that they were not represented when it came to um, the white women uh, bringing up problems or issues or approaching things in certain ways. And so it, it is, it can be an issue, but it doesn't need to be a problem. It needs to be a segue into working together and finding solutions. Um, and I, it, it's unfortunate that people of color seem to always be put in the place of being the educators. But I mean, I, I try to embrace that because if I'm not going to do it, then the ignorance is just going to continue. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed and to be recognized that it does exist. Uh, for me, it's just not only am I female and I'm Latinx, but I'm also queer. So I. The intersectionality helps because I kind of bounce around in these groups and try to, like, for comic books, I try to learn everything I can and give recommendations based on who is coming into the store. Somebody queer comes in, hey, I can give you queer comics or comics made by queer artists and stuff like that, and here's all of this. Someone Latinx comes in and they want uh, more Latin, uh, somebody, something focused on Latinx identity, I can give that to them as well. Uh, when a woman comes in, I can give her books that, uh, that reflect her and stuff like that. So it's kind of... For me, that intersectionality makes me more open to everything. So I, I kind of, uh, I kind of like go and reach out into broad sections of not only just my identity, but also how I can share my identity with people who are like me as well. That's like the biggest thing with I think um, being creators. The intersectionality is just like a wonderful byproduct of creating things that are authentic. Um, something that was really amazing for me was um, I am, well, I'm in my last semester of college and I'm pursuing my undergraduate in animation, so I'm working on my thesis film. And my thesis film is about growing up in, uh, I grew up in New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and my family didn't want me to speak Spanish. That was from a time when my parents were like, oh no, it's gonna like mess up your opportunities. We don't wanna like, you know, for whatever reason they had. So um, I grew up not speaking Spanish and that's like a huge like, it's a thing. It's a barrier now. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a big barrier. it's a big barrier. So that's what my thesis film is about. It's about not speaking Spanish. And when I've done showings of it and when I've been workshopping it with people, kind of the most amazing experience I've had with it is that people who are not Latinx, but people who are Japanese, Vietnamese, you know, 
second, third generation Americans from all sorts of different cultures have come to me and they've been like, that's me. So the fact that the authenticity of my own experience was something that I could share that everybody who saw it and related to it, they, they were able to relate to it. Like I think that that's like just so important and that's so, like that's just such a big part of creating authentic content is the intersectionality comes with that because we all have these shared experiences even if they're in different contexts. That's a. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say that's a good segue to my part because I was like talking about intersection. I actually am a Latinx female, but I am now a mom, and in our community, family is very important. Uh, and uh, I'm a mom of a boy, so one of the biggest thing or uh, commitments to me was I need to speak Spanish to him. I want him to learn Spanish because I have a lot of nephews and we speak Spanish. But the moment they set foot in school, they did not want to speak Spanish anymore. They refused. And it wasn't so much that they didn't want to. I think they felt embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And they realized, I'm different for the first time because they're sheltered at home. Nobody made any, nobody made comments that they spoke Spanish or English at home. But suddenly, they're at school, and there is a difference. So that's something that I've been trying to make sure I incorporate. And now in my videos, I try to incorporate, incorporate my child as well. I put him in the camera with me. Uh, I dress him up. If there's a special char character that I'm into that month, I dress him up. We're throwing him a party, and it's Batman theme. So it's uh, it's that. But I also try to make sure that he knows his uh, his culture and his language, because I know it's it's a big. It's uh, huge. It's huge for the community mm -hmm. uh, and friends that I know that are sad that they don't speak the language, but it wasn't because their parents did not want it the best for him. It was because their parents wanted to protect them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that they actually didn't teach mm -hmm. them the language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just gonna a quick add on to what everyone was saying, is that I think that diversity within the Latinx community is also something that gets a little bit swept under the rug. I mean, mm -hmm. we all on this panel have our own personal Latinx cultural experiences and even just within our podcast you know Jen is Guatemalan I'm Mexican um, uh, background and Sarah uh, she's also Mexican but she's married to Nicaraguan and so that really affects a lot of um, what we talk about and you know sometimes they come up with words I'm like I've never heard that word for that before and so <laughs> and that people have actually come up to us and said that they really appreciate that diversity that is just it's just who we are but I think that um, also, uh, the community itself just struggles with kind of um, fighting against that um, stereotype of all Latinos are Mexican. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not true. And mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's also amazing that so much of us on this panel are here with so many different diverse backgrounds and we're out there doing stuff and we are in the process educating. I just wanted to add to the whole language thing is that Spanish was my first language. My mom could only speak Spanish, and so that was all I learned. Learned my English through Sesame Street. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hard <laughs> say, <laughs> hard <laughs> say. <laughs> and so growing up, I didn't really need it so much in elementary school because everyone spoke English. My mom wanted me to start learning English, but at the same time, I was like little mini translator for her going to doctor's appointments and translating for her. Same thing has worked now. I, outside of cosplay and going to wrestling on the weekends, I am a nurse. And so that language, you know, being able to speak both English and Spanish has been such a blessing. But at the same time, with the current political climate, I've been feeling a little bit anxious about speaking Spanish. Like if I'm speaking to my mom in restaurants in Spanish, sometimes we get a couple looks and I'll try to go Spanglish. Just be like, look, I speak English, it's okay, kind of thing. <laughs> and so, um, being going, you know, with cosplay, I go to uh, San Diego Comic Con a lot. We get a lot of tourists from all over the place, especially from Mexico. And sometimes they'll like try to come up to you, ask for pictures, and they'll try to do it in English. And you can tell mm -hmm. that they're a little bit nervous with their broken English. So as soon as I say, "Oh, quieres una foto?" Oh my gosh, their faces light up. They start talking to you nonstop. You start. They start telling about where they came from, about how they've been following you, and it's just so nice to be able to break that barrier and to be able to um, be kind of like an ambassador between myself and them for cosplay. Same thing in like Lucha. 
a lot of the luchadors are from like Mexico. When they come to the States for the very first time, they look like lost little lambs. So as soon as I go up to them to introduce myself, I start talking to them in Spanish and it's like the biggest relief for them. And yeah, it's just, it's so great. And if you speak Spanish and English, you can speak to 60% of the whole world, which is really nice. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think some of you guys already kind of touched on this, but uh, were any of these experiences obviously the motivation for the things that you're doing now? Uh, you guys have already kind of touched on it, but is there anything like when, I guess I can move and say, was there one pivotal moment that you're like, this is why I'm gonna do my art, my craft, my hobby because of this? Um, I'll say I'll say something, I, because I went to the Comic Con for the first time with my then boyfriend, now husband. <laughs> but um, the funniest thing happened, it's that he's really tall and I'm really short. And so, chiquita pero picosa. <laughs> so when we went to the Comic Con, he was uh, going through the books, uh, looking for comic books. And I, went, I saw books on the bottom of the table. And I was like, oh, nobody's checking those out. I can fit it under the table. So I actually went under the table, and I started pulling boxes. And uh, I know I back then I had an idea of the ones that he really liked or the ones, the key issues. And if you're a collector, you know that you're probably not going to find those key issues at a convention because they're probably already slab on the wall for a 1,000 plus. But... Um, but I came across an action comic, uh, action comic one, a reprint, and I pulled it out, and I went, oh, how about this one? Is this one important? And he looks at me, and he's like, where the heck did you give it to me? Like, right away, he's, he grabbed it from my hands and put it in his backpack, he's like, and he's like, I'm going to pay you, I'm going to pay you. But it was in the dollar bin. And so he was so excited. And he, I knew it was important, but I knew it wasn't the, the real comic book. But we got so excited, and... He was recording, so that was the whole beginning of, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. And even though he's a guy, he's pretty shy. He's a, he's a big nerd, he's a geek. So he is not a, a person who's gonna go ask questions, but when he saw me asking all these questions, he was like, okay, I have to record this because I know there's a lot of male out there that also are gonna um, connect with this video because they probably wish they could jump the way you jump when you found this comic book and make all this fuss, but we're guys, we don't do that. So he's like, but you can do that and nobody's gonna tell you anything. So that was the reason why we started making these videos and I really enjoy it now. It's become a, a, a hobby and now my family is actually joining. My nephew's dressed up and they're always asking, when is the next one and can we tag along? And if it's free, uh, if you're a Latino family, you yes. have a bunch of children, so you're like, yes, it's free, kids can come. If it's not free for kids, I don't take them. <laughs> I feel you on that one. The sisters, the sisters and the nephew are coming later on today. So. <laughs> uh, well, for me, I um, I just wanted to talk about comic books. Uh, having tried and failed like uh, about three podcasts, I was like, I just want to talk comic books. Why can't anybody just sit with me and talk comic books. And then I met Kristen, and Kristen was like, we should do it on Latinx creators and artists. And I was like, we're going to run out of content, dude. <laughs> like, seriously. So then um, I said, why don't we include women as well, like creators, writers, artists. And then, uh, and then we included that. But then we ran into the Latinx creator community, and it's been like, we haven't run out of content. If anything, there's new stuff coming out because we are telling our stories now, so it's been very exciting. So that's kind of like what propelled us to do our podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so mine is in a particular instance, per se. It's just things that get me mad. It's really just the truth of it. Um, the femicide. So what has to do with the femicide? What is the plot is, right? Like, that's been going on since the 80s. I had to research it. It's really insanely horrible. And my other grandma's from Chihuahua and Jalisco, which is so both my grandmas are in the story as well. And so um, I write what gets me mad because I'll finish writing it. It's literally something that I want to bring attention to. It's something that I can save the females, at least in my story, I can save them. Um, and so, and also, if we once we hit like uh, net profit, when we hit profits, uh, portions actually get donated to the organizations as well. Um, the next one we're writing is Santa, or we're working on right now is Santa. And like that has to do with, um, it's a border town, and we have a little chipster girl, and she goes up against ICE, you know, and she literally raids the concentration camp. Same thing. It just, and I wrote this last year before it actually got really horrible this year. And so, like, it's stuff that gets me mad. 
that's really it. Like, it's not that I want to write and, you know, talk about all this stuff, but it's something that is important. And, like, I don't need a guy flying around in the air. I don't care. I need people to save us. And so, at least here I can. Um, for me, it was kind of like, well, uh, what I mentioned with my film, people coming up to me, that was really magical. Um, and that made me realize that I wanted to cr uh, continue creating. But kind of what was... Um, what sort of like jump started me to feeling comfortable um, to make art about my background and my heritage and my community was really just moving away from home um, because I had never lived anywhere except for New Mexico. So going from New Mexico to California, and I moved to Orange County. So it was it was so that was where my art school is. So it was just so different. And I was like the architect. My parents were always like, you know, you're never going to see architecture like this. And I was like, whatever, dad. <laughs> and then I came here, and I was like, oh, my God, everything looks different. And I just really missed it. And that was kind of what um, pushed me to start creating more content about everything that I missed, but also kind of like reinterpreting it in new ways. And I think that that's the cool thing about being a Latinx creator specifically is that, you know, we're making stories about ourselves and about these about issues and things like that. But we're also making stories about just anything you want to make about. Um, I'm working on a project, a personal project right now that um, I loved Yu Yu Hakusho growing up. That was my favorite anime. I care about it so much. <laughs> but I wanted the girls to be less useless. I wanted them to do it more. <laughs> so for a personal project of mine, I ended up taking it and kind of bastardizing it. And I set it in New Mexico. And it was completely different at that point. It completely changed it. And by adding that part of my own culture in and adding that perspective, it started spinballing into something completely different. And I think that's like what makes the creation process so amazing. And that's why it's like so, just so great to be comfortable to be doing that. So that was like, for me, moving away from home really just like solidified that, that path for me. Cool. Cool. And then uh, some of you actually already started, because of how we had this conversation. I love this, because when the panelists are great at speaking to each other, it's just awesome. Uh, but you kind of touched on it. But what is something that you guys have been, you have found to be, very unique to the Latina representation in these geek areas or that you're very proud of? Like something that is, you can feel we own as Lat Latinas in this type of geekdom and areas that we're in. <clears throat> we own community, that's for sure. Uh, I have every Latina Latino looks at my table or our, our booth out there. And so, and it's and not whether or not they stop, I don't really care. They give me a smile, and it's something like that is really cool, right? This is my first booth, it's our first booth here. Um, so I'm very happy. I'm very appreciative of on, of everything, honestly. Um, I have a little doll on the table because I want to make a doll in the future of the Hellia School, and like every little girl smiles, <laughs> right? Like, and same thing. It's just literally that. Um, and it's Elena de Avalor, so she's a little bit darker. Same thing. I just want our representation, but. It's the community that was saying that we're all on the same level. We all understand where we are and where we want to be, which is a very nice thing. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite things, uh, flogorico people, right? Like our dances were completely different than everyone else's. Um, and so like uh, I was telling her, like somebody wrote me and they're like, I teach a flogorico class up north, up in like Salinas. And like for our first position, like when they put their arms out, she's like, I just say, get in your flogorico. Um, I get in Jalisco stance. And literally everyone like, oh, it's superhero stance, I'm sorry, getting into a superhero stance. And they light up and they get in their superhero stance, which is her pose, excuse me, which the is her pose up. like that. <laughs> you know, and I was like, that is like, I don't foresee that at all. It's just a, but, yeah. uh, a fact. And I was like, that is an amazing effect. Close together. Yeah. 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 From like a animation standpoint, um, so many of my peers are women and Latinx women. Like, we're flooding the industry. It really is a thing. Like most of my, I've had classes that are only women, which is just amazing to see that. So like, I think that that's something that we're really starting to corner on is just like, we're feeling comfortable as creators and we come in for animation. It's happening. <laughs> so, I, oh, oh, sorry. No, you <laughs> go I ahead. thought we were going in order. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I broke the, I, I just wanted to say that uh, <laughs> as we go to, um, as we travel, we try to incorporate, if we find comic book shops in other countries, we're trying to highlight that in our videos. And we went to El Salvador, and I had never seen a comic book in Spanish. And when I was in the airport, there was a little store, and I was like, comic books, so I walk over. And it was just amazing to read the comic book. It was a, it was a Marvel comic book, and I can't remember what it was. But I just bought it because it was in Spanish. <laughs> it was nothing important, but I was like, oh, it's in Spanish. But 
it reminded me of how we grew up watching TV, and I think about TV and what who I saw that talk about comics, and I never knew there were comic books until I became older, but I grew up watching El Chavo and Chespirito yeah. <laughs> and Chapulín Colorado, and I remember, like, oh, I wish I could turn myself into this tiny ant. And then I'm like, oh, it's almost like Atman. Oh, my gosh. It's like, and then I started <laughs> connecting the pieces. But he was funny, and I connected with him. And then um, I'm going to actually, in my next YouTube channel, in my next YouTube episode, we just got our first uh, comic book of El Chavo. Uh, so <laughs> we've been hunting for this comic book, and I just got it and haven't opened it yet. But that little excitement to me it's kind of like <laughs> yeah so it's like i'm excited to share this episode with my audience because it's spanish english and it's all that we grew up watching on tv but the reality is that there's comic books out there about these characters remind me to to find you because i have an art piece that i have out oh, there that has awesome. travel on it <laughs> <laughs> well and cosplay kind of started noticing that um well as a cosplayer we do a lot of our networking through social media um, a couple of years ago, it was all just predominantly like white um, female models. And now as my suggestions are coming up, I'm starting to see more cosplayer models from like Mexico. And to me, that was surprising because I would try to explain it, the whole cosplay concept to my mom. And her whole thing would be like, why? You're like, blah, blah, blah years old. Yeah. It's not Halloween. Why are you dressing up? Like it's a waste of money. Oh Is God. it yes. making you money? And then, like, it's like, first she's like, it's a waste of time. You're just wasting all this money. But then when she sees all this, because mira, esto es mi mija. Mira, mira, to everybody, right? So to see, and then, like, again, in nursing, as you start to get to know your patients, they want to get to know about what you do on the weekend. How was your weekend? What'd you do? I'd be able to say, well, I'm going to Comic Con. What's, yeah. what's that? Why are you going with all the nerds? Like, why? <laughs> and then I would try to explain to them, like, well, I dress up. Well, why? It's not Halloween. That was always the thing that I would get. <laughs> and so now being able to explain to them, like, look, it's okay to dress up when it's not Halloween and it's okay to do it for fun. Um, and seeing, like I said, a lot more um, people that I'm meeting from Mexico that now know about cosplay. Because even the luchadors, when they ask me, well, what do you do? I'm like, I cosplay. What's that? Why do you dress up? Why do you dress up? That There's no reason to it. <laughs> and now, <laughs> no, really. They're like, ¿Qué te viste de diablo? ¿Por qué? Like, you know, stuff like that. So um, now they're starting to be more exposed to the cosplay where they're like, oh, yeah, people are dressing up as us. Like, before, it was just a concept that they couldn't understand. And now, like I said, to see it as far as, like, Luchador's being to understand cosplay and a lot more um, Mexican, American, or just Latinx um, cosplayers coming in and understanding the concept. That's when I was like, okay, we're really crossing over. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> um, what I'm really proud of is the fact that we've met a lot of uh, creators that are Latinx and are telling our stories. And what makes me really proud is when I meet somebody who's not into comic books or they want a suggestion, I can say, hey, there's Quince, and a special announcement, they're going to release um, it in Spanish as well. I mean, it was released in individual comic books in Spanish and English, but now they're going to do the trade paperback in Spanish. So I'll be able to give it to my tia, and like I have a stepdaughter who came from Nicaragua, I could give it to her, and it's going to be in Spanish, and, and they can understand the concept of loving comic books. So that's what I'm really proud of. For us in our podcast, the thing when we do interviews uh, called Las Platicas, uh, and what we've heard a lot of feedback from a lot of the people that we've interviewed is that as soon as they come in to be interviewed, we create an atmosphere of Latias just talking, chismeando, and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's easier for them to open up about their work. And just kind of the fact that we have, without even really meaning to, have created this atmosphere in our podcast when we're interviewing people of like, like come and talk and the people do and they open up about their work and everything. Uh, I've, I find that really amazing in the fact that we were able to create that atmosphere just by being ourselves, being Latina women, talking about comics. As a little piggyback on that, I'm most proud of the fact that we had this hardcore cholo in our yes. uh, oh. in our studio yeah. the other day, and we made him cry. <laughs> <laughs> but part of our podcast is we actually, uh, Sarah and I are huge craft beer, beer fans, and I was like, I want to, because that's another industry where women are yes. very um, invisible. Oh, but I was yes. like, 
I like beer. You like beer. We should just like talk about beer. So we do a very small segment on our podcast called Hora de la Cervecita. And um, we try a different craft brew every time. And it's just a taste. And we like review it and talk about it. But there is um, a, a, a surgeon of Latinos in the craft brewery um, industry as well. And um, Beer Thug Life is here local to Los Angeles. And we had him in the studio. And being able to provide access to our listeners, to people that they may never have heard of, to books they've never heard of, to creators and characters that they've never heard of before is what I am most proud of. I want to give this opportunity to see if the audience has any questions that they want to ask any of our panelists. Anything at all? Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Uh, what craft beer would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you my favorite. Uh, Sticky Monkey, really good. Nice a stout. Yeah, that's from Firestone. So, um, and it's uh, it doesn't it's not openly available, but it comes out I think seasonally every year. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I'm sure it's coming out. I think it comes out in the winter time. So yeah, yeah. just keep an eye out. Yeah. It depends on what you like. I'm a huge IPA fan, and um, <laughs> Beer Thug Life actually collaborated with the brewery who I can't remember the one. A in local Tahatiki, craft, yeah, right? local craft brewery. Um, and it's called In Haze We Trust. And so it is good. amazing. And the first run ran out, but they're going to rebrew it. And it's just, I keep your eye out for it because it's just so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I always recommend uh, uh, Monkish is a good starting point, but they're really strong, so you have to really be careful. Um, they taste so good; they're almost like so, like uh, in like juice. So uh, you might get a little carried away and order like three. Just you know, just take it easy. And, it's, <laughs> and staying with theme, if you guys don't know, there is a Latino-run brewery in Bell called oh, yes. Border X Brewing, and Delicious. all of their brews. Um, are based on um, Latino flavors. They have an horchata beer mm -hmm. that is amazing, will blow your mind. It tastes like horchata and like someone poured like whiskey in it or something. <laughs> it's good. And it's it's okay. also in Barrio Logan, the original yes. one. Oh yeah, the original, the original one's in San Diego. San Diego, Barrio, yeah. Logan. And shout out to them, because they do uh, Chicano Con uh, during the time that San Diego Comic Con happens. That's so right. like you might want to stop by over there and meet like local artists and, and um, and writers and they and they have beer and it's if great. If you can't score tickets to San Diego, just go, take the uh, bar. It's not Bart here. The, the, the trolley. trolley down to uh, to Barrio Logan and they have a mini Comic Con that is free to the community mm -hmm. and it's nothing but Latinx creators. Mm -hmm. Cool. So right as we do our plugs, uh, if there's any advice or anything you want other um, Latinx or Latinas to actually like coming into geekdom and advice you want to give them and then. Feel free to plug yourselves. <laughs> well, um, I ran across a picture on social media where, uh, you know, the um, the warriors in, uh, um, what is it called, um, Black Panther, uh, they were, they were the these, these, yeah, and they were a little bit uh, robust and sort of looked like me, and they were cosplaying these warriors, strong women, and I was just like, that's what I'm talking about. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something because you're, you know, you don't fit a uh, size two, or, or you know, or you're too brown, or you're too short. Just do whatever you love because you can do it and be strong and represent us and just do it out of love. Did I? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> plug yourself. You can plug yourself. You can't plug yourself. Oh. <laughs> If you want to get into comic books, listen to our podcast, Comadre C Comics. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, Podomatic, and all those other sites. Oh. And you can follow us on Facebook at Comic Comadres, on Instagram, Comadre C Comics. We're also on um, Twitter and Snapchat. And you can email us at uh, comadresecomics at gmail.com. Also, um, at the end of this panel, you can find me outside, and I have some swag if you guys want some, oh like God. a lot of cool little stuff. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm not a comic book person. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. He's hiding his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You will join us. You will join us. <laughs> one, one of us. us. One <laughs> of us. <laughs> <laughs> I 
guarantee you, you'll find something that you enjoy if you listen to our podcast because we have <laughs> tons of recommendations. <laughs> if you want a Mexican superhero or a Latino superhero, I would recommend looking the Blue Beetle run with Jaime Reyes. Oh, yeah. He's yes. amazing. Yes, good. But plug yourself, Crystal. Yeah. Do you have any plug? advice? In plug? Uh, my plug is do whatever you want. It's your life. Like my mom says, if they're not paying your bills, who cares? <laughs> so don't let anyone tell you you can't dress up because of your color. Color is just, I mean, just do it. That's all I can say. And I don't know what else I can do to plug. Where can we find uh, you? I'm mainly on Instagram nowadays. Um, <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram at the Crystal Method, not the band. Um, <laughs> um, it's with the K. With the K. <laughs> <laughs> And if you want to learn, and actually, if you want a little video about the Chicano Con at San Diego, <laughs> yes. YNC Comics had a video about this. <laughs> if you want to know about East LA Comic Con, which is on their third year, and that's where I met Comadres and Comics, and I will tell you, the reason I came to their booth was because they had conchas. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, that's something I know. <laughs> so, um, YNC Comics, uh, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And um, and you can email us at yncomics at gmail.com as well. If you have an event coming up, you can invite us. We like to highlight the events, especially if they're in the community, because we notice that a lot of cities are putting comic cons together now. And I will tell you something that I enjoy about the cosplayers is that more than ever, I see more families coming to these events. And seeing little girls, I started dressing up on the videos, uh, and sometimes I you use a whole custom, sometimes it's just a t-shirt. But when I am dressed up as Wonder Woman or, and I used to be intimidated because I was like, but I don't look like Wonder Woman. Like, look, I'm not, I don't have a tiny <laughs> waist. But, um, but when I started seeing uh, more girls like me dressing up, more curvy, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna dress up. Who cares if I don't, if I don't fit into the mold? I'm gonna make my own. And when I see little girls coming up, and they're, or they see me on the train, and they're like, oh, mom, look, there's Wonder Woman. And they're saying it in Spanish. It's really exciting, because I know that now they found not just Wonder Woman, it's somebody who looks like them. So follow your passion. And that's what we started doing. And now our, our YNC Comics is becoming bigger than, than what I thought. I have no words of wisdom. I have no wisdom. I, I'm just here. Um, but if you want to follow my art, um, I'm mainly on Instagram and Twitter. It's Amanda Julina. Amanda, J-U-L-I-N-A. People spell it wrong a lot. Um, and I'm probably going to start streaming on Twitch of myself animating soon. So keep an eye out for that because I really need something to hold me accountable to finish said film. So. <laughs> I agree. Definitely hold her accountable. Uh, so, um, Jalisco oh superhero uh, is my Instagram. It's, uh, Jalisco superhero, J A L I S C O, and then um, the website is Jalisco superhero dot com. And I agree with you. I do not like comics. I had to research how to make a comic, um, how to get a pencil or a letter. It's like literally, I know it all within reason now structurally, uh, but it is not my world, which is why I tell you I don't really speak on it. Uh, but it is an amazing world to be in, to be honest with you. Uh, you establish your IP, you get your audience. You know, same thing. Um, bigger goals, like get on the screen. Uh, in regards to words of wisdom, just go out and do it. There's no point in waiting. Like um, YouTube, or literally YouTube and Google is your friend. I learned everything. I learned filmmaking through YouTube, uh, through reading as well, but really YouTube. Uh, <laughs> same thing with the graphic novels, right? Like that is literally research. If you don't understand it, there's answers. Um, everything is literally at our fingertips nowadays. So. I'm gonna do a little backwards. I'm gonna do my plug first, and then I'm gonna do my last finishing words. Uh, so my name is Paula Carvajal, uh, Paula CK is the, uh, the, my acronym that I go for all the time. Um, I'm actually part of a comic book creator uh, group here called Sketchy Bugs, um, and I volunteer at the Comic Bug as well. Um, I've gone to all these cons. That's how I met them too at East LA too. Uh, they're all great cons. Um, I'm currently part of. Uh, speaking of representation, I'm currently one of the few. Latinas that I know that plays D and D on YouTube uh, with our vicious mockery group with my husband and a few of our other production company that's over there. So check us out on YouTube and all the social medias. But I wanted to say thank you guys so much for being a part of this panel. Um, part of the inspiration was also that I am a first generation Latina here. Um, so it is very rare to find, to be in the geekdom and to find a community and try to establish it. And this was kind of my outreach. And I, I greatly appreciate you guys being here. I hope you guys appreciated it as well and hearing their stories. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, I know a few of them will also be on the, on the, on the uh, exhibitor floor at some of their tables in their booths, so feel free to look us around. And thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much for your open your experiences. Thank you. And thank for you. some of them who are your first time panelists, you guys did it. <laughs> <laughs>